please consider it. It'll change your life. Uh, if you're interested at all in what that's about, what that looks like, what all is going to be uh, happening during that mission trip, um, please come to the informational meeting and get all your questions answered there. Uh, this evening, we're going to have a guest speaker. His name is Thomas Harding. He's a church planner to Portland, Oregon. He'll be presenting his ministry and preaching to us this evening, so please plan to join us for that. Ladies Bunko, if you're interested in rolling dice and shuffling around and having a good time of fellowship, ladies, come uh, Thursday, April 18th uh, at 8 or I'm sorry, not 8, at 6.30 p.m. If you want a late night, come at 8. It might be done by then. April 18th, 6.30 p.m. this Thursday. And if you come, bring a snack to share so everybody can enjoy it. Baptisms. Uh, there are two ordinances that God has commanded for man. That's the Lord's Supper and baptisms. If you have not been biblically baptized, you need to do so. Uh, Sunday, April 28th, during morning service, we'll have opportunities to get baptized. And so it's a very, very important step in every believer on your journey to Christ's likeness. So if you want to get biblically baptized, please consider that April 28th. Uh, sign up on the Connect card or talk to Pastor Brad if you want to get that uh, first step of obedience uh, to following Christ taken care of. 50 and Holding will have their luncheon Friday, April 19th at 1230. Apparently that's a new time. Take note of that if you want to attend. 1230 in the Fellowship Hall, same location. Uh, the theme this month will be chicken salad and croissants and whatever side people want to bring. Please let Jan Brown know if you plan to attend that. Kickball is uh, right around the corner. We've been announcing it for a few weeks. Uh, this is kind of last call here. If you're interested in kickball, uh, we need to know now. We don't quite have enough people um, to, make a, to make a full team and get this going. So if you want to play kickball, please let us know. You can sign up at the Connect desk. If you're interested, there's a form out there, uh, and we'll see what we can get going. Last announcements here. I need your attention. If you would, pay attention. This is a big one. Dinner groups. All right, we got second round of dinner groups coming up soon. And so we'll be sending out the new group list to the host here in the next few weeks. Here's the important part. If you've been part of dinner groups these last few months and you want to stay involved and keep your status the same, do nothing. If you need to sign up or make changes like I hosted the first time, but I can't host this time or I'm wanting to host this time and I wasn't a host last time, or if I was participating but now I cannot participate, that's the information we need to know. So please use the Connect card to either sign up or make changes to your status in hosting or not hosting. Hopefully that's clear. If it's not as clear as mud, come see me and uh, we'll, get you, we'll get you taken care of. And with that, we'll ask uh, God to richly bless the preaching of his word this morning. Good morning. Thanks for being here today. Appreciate you guys coming out. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer and we'll get rolling. Father, we are thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ. We appreciate the chance to gather here and open your word together. We ask that you would bless our time. Father, I pray, Lord, that we would just be able to set aside the busyness of life, all the things that we've got going on. Lord, even our cares and our concerns that might be troubling us at the moment, help us to just clear off space in our minds and in our hearts so that your Holy Spirit can have free course this morning. Uh, I personally pray, Father, that you would fill me with your spirit, that you would give me the ability to clearly communicate the message that you desire for us to hear this morning. Lord, all of, all of this we desire to see you do so that you'll be glorified to the maximum. That's our heart's desire. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week, we kicked off a new series that we've been calling Big Faith. And in this series, what we're, what we're desiring is that God will develop in us Big faith. We, we want to be people that are known for being people of faith. It's an important part of our Christianity, of our life with Christ. If we don't have faith, we'll see in a few weeks that it's impossible to please God without that. But we desire God to build a big faith in us. We also want to have a, a testimony 
of being people of faith. Uh, we want God to uh, look at us and, and, and see us with favor. We want uh, the world to look at our life and see that we're people of faith. And so we're, we're taking on the challenge of working our way through Hebrews chapter 11 to see what God has to say in the chapter that's often referred to as the hall of faith or God's hall of fame. And so we're going to be looking at this for the next several weeks. But we want faith that's spoken of throughout the throughout the world. We looked at that in the book of Romans. Paul says to them in the first chapter that their faith as a church was collectively spoken of throughout the world. It was recognized. Hey, that's a church of faith. And we certainly want to be that here at Grace. Not so people recognize us or think better of us or think we're really something special, but we want God to be glorified through that. And so we want that type of testimony. We want to be people that trust God at all times, no matter what's going on in our life. Wouldn't you like to be able to do that? No matter what life is throwing at you, no matter what's coming your way, that you could be a person that says, hey, I'm faithful to God, I'm trusting God through this, whatever it may be. As we kicked off last week, we saw, we, we talked about faith in three different ways, or three different levels maybe of faith. First, we saw that there's an intellectual faith. This is the faith that believes God can do anything. That we believe in God that exists, and we believe he can do anything. Got to start there, right? We've, we've got to believe that God is, and that God is all-powerful in our life. But that's never enough. In fact, we saw last week that the Bible says that the devils believe in God, so they have faith that God exists, and he is powerful. They understand that. But we need that. We have to have that, at least that baseline faith in our life. Then we talked about an emotional faith. And that's, that's where we begin to desire for a God that exists and can do anything to do something in our life. Whatever that may be. Whatever we're dealing with, whatever we're struggling with, whatever need we have on the horizon, we have a desire in our heart. Maybe we begin to cry out to God, God, work in this situation. Work in this way. We need you to come through in a big way in our life. That's that emotional desire where we begin to seek God to do something. But then we saw a third level, and this is where we, what we've got to get. We're calling it operational faith. That's faith that moves. I believe God exists. I want God to do something because he can do anything. But now I'm going to change the way I live, and I'm going to live like God's doing it already. Faith, people of big faith, their faith moves. It has action. It operates. It changes the way that they live their life. And we desire to be those type of people in our life. But building that type of faith in our life it's a long-term process. We can't snap our fingers and it's, and it's that way. It doesn't happen overnight. But that journey to being a person of big faith that trusts God in every circumstances, that journey always begins with the same first step. And that is having a faith that saves. We have to be saved. We have to be a child of God in order for God to build big faith in our life. If we don't have saving faith in our life, the rest of this is, is, is just academic. It doesn't make any difference. We first have to have a relationship with God based upon uh, uh, Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross in order for God to build that big faith in us. You know, I think all of mankind is on a quest for how to obtain God's favor. How, how do I have a relationship with with God. Even if they can't articulate it that way, there's a sense in us that says, you know, something's not right, something is missing. And when we think about the world and we think about God and we think about people seeking God and desiring to have a relationship with God, and we look around the entire globe and the billions of people that are here, we think, well, there's a, almost an innumerable number of ways that people are trying to have a relationship with God, to seek God. That appears to be the case, but I would submit to you that everything really boils down into two categories. There's either religion or relationship. There's either religion which says mankind, humanity, we, people, have to work in order to obtain God's favor. Or there's a relationship that has faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting in his finished work, in order to gain eternal life. Everything falls into one of those two categories. There may be all types of different variations and bells and whistles, but when you boil it all down, 
you land in one of those two camps. I can relate to that. I, I, many of you know my story, at least parts of my story, uh, because I, I share it often. But I remember growing up in the suburbs not too far from here, and I grew up in a, a religious home. Uh, my mom uh, primarily took us to church. It was a, a main, more of a mainline denomination, and, and she uh, thought that that was important in our life. And so uh, uh, me and my brother, we were both baptized as, 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 as young children or, or infants in this particular church. Uh, we were confirmed in that church. I served as an altar boy in that church, uh, I, and we attended often. And I, I remember even in my teen years trying to connect with God. I would try and spend time reading the Bible. Somehow knew that was important. I would try, you know, I'd start at the beginning. I'd get in Genesis 1, and I'd, I usually saved it till bedtime. So I'm in my bed, and I'm trying to read, and it didn't take too long. I would always falter and fail. I tried to read, I tried to pray. Tried to pray to God. I knew that that was our way of communicating with God. I, I, I even remember in high school uh, being an athlete, going to a fellowship of Christian athlete meetings and, and, and trying to be a, generally be a good uh, kid, a good man, a good guy. But I was doing all that to simply gain God's favor. I wanted God to think I was worthy. But you know what I found in my own life is I couldn't live up to my own standards much less God's standards. I wasn't able to live a good enough life to, get, uh, to merit entrance into heaven. I, I often felt like a failure in those terms. I, I just couldn't live up to it. I couldn't be a good enough person. I, I continually failed and faltered and, and, and misstepped in my life, and it left me uh, feeling empty. It left me on a search, and so I started to search for satisfaction and happiness and fulfillment in other things in life, not related to religion. In fact, almost the opposite of, of what might be a good life, and started to seek uh, the, the pleasure of this, of this life, of this, of this world, and I, I, was, I was on a search, but at the end of it all, I just felt empty, but strangely prideful, thinking I was, I'm all right. I'm not perfect, but I'm better than most. But I was longing for more. And there came a time in my life, in my 20s, when I came to realize that it wasn't about me keeping a particular set of religious rules. I, I finally realized why Jesus came. Why Jesus came to earth. Why, why did he come here to earth and die and then be resurrected? He did that so that I wouldn't have to die. He did for me what I couldn't do for myself. I couldn't live a perfect life, but he did. And it's on the basis of what he did that I could get entrance into heaven. I moved from religion to relationship with Jesus Christ. I was what the scripture calls saved. I was what John 3 describes as being born again. And, and that moved me from that, that camp of religion where I was trying to work in order to gain God's favor to a place of relationship where I am trusting in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ in order to have salvation in my life. I think my story's common. I'm sure many of you would go, yeah, details might be a little different, but I, I'm with you. I'm tracking with you. I was there too. I, I, I had a time in my life where I moved from religion to relationship. The, we, we can all relate to that point in our life where we finally realize that our need lies with God. It re, it, it, the fulfillment that we seek lies with Jesus Christ. And, and people all over the world are seeking to connect with God. They're, they're doing it either through religion, people at work, or relationship, God at work. It, it really boils down to those two camps. This morning, I want to I look at that by looking at a famous story, an old story, one of the oldest stories in Scripture, 
about two brothers who were attempting to relate to God. They're both coming to God, trying to worship God, connect with God, but they go about it in very different ways. One chooses the way of religion, doing things his way, relying on his works, whereas the other relies on the work that only God could do. Let's read a verse, one verse in Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4. Hebrews 11 and verse 4. It says, By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. And so again, we have a very short verse in Hebrews 11 this morning. It talks about two brothers, Cain and Abel, and their different approaches to God. How they came to God differently. One did it the right way, one did it the wrong way. And let's, let's see, let's go back to Genesis and let's see how this unfolded. So if you got your Bible, flip back to Genesis chapter 4. It's where we're going to be for most of the time this morning. We're going to look at a lot of passages this morning. So if you got your Bible there, you might want to give it a, a thumb through. <laughs> Just to undo those pages that you haven't cracked in a while. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 3, it says, And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And so let's, let's unpack this. Let's look at these two brothers. Let's look at the different offerings that each of them bring. And as I said uh, in the introduction, I think that these two approaches to connecting with God, coming to God, perfectly describe religion versus relationship. People at work versus God at work. First, let's look at, at Cain and what he brought. What does the passage that we just read say that Cain brought as his offering to God? He brought the fruit of the ground. Now, I'm sure the, the fruit that Cain brought was spectacular. I've got a, a little basket of fruit up here just as a visual aid to make you hungry. And, and as spectacular as I'm sure, that's real, by the way. It's not, it's not plastic. Look, that's real. That's real fruit. Give me a sec. <laughs> I don't want to spit it out. If I choke, who here knows CPR? Okay, I'm good. I'm sure Cain's offering looked way better than this. And, and don't come up to me after me afterwards and go, I, I don't think he had pineapples. I, don't, I know, all right? <laughs> it's an illustration, all right? I'm not, not, all right? And he probably had uh, ve what we would call vegetables too and different grains and all those types of things that he brought. But it says he brought this fruit of the ground. And I think that Cain's offering represents our own labors, he had, he, I'm sure he had worked hard to make sure that the fruit that he was growing was beautiful, lush, just perfect, blemish-free. I'm sure he, he came and brought a, a, an awesome offering to God. But it pictures those uh, religious works that we try and do. Every religion is built upon the premise that I have to do more good works in order to have a better chance of getting into heaven. Every religion is built on that premise. In fact, a Gallup poll showed that nearly 70% of people surveyed believed that getting into heaven is by living a good life. That's what most people think, is that if I live a good enough life, then God, when my time comes, he's going to let me into heaven. 
I'm sure when Cain brought his offering, he was sincere when he brought it. I'm sure he brought a sincere offering of, of the fruit that he had grown, that he had worked so hard to grow. Problem is, that's not what God asked him to do. That's not the offering that God wanted from them. That's the problem that he's facing. There are, later on as the law is written, there are offerings that they would bring that would be of the fruit of the ground. But they were always free will offerings, tithes. They were never associated with a sin offering. You know what's required to offer for sin? Blood. Blood. The old saying is you can't get blood out of a turnip. That's where it comes from. <laughs> He brought a great offering. It just wasn't the offering that God wanted him to bring. That's the problem. Why, why wasn't this sufficient? Look in Genesis again. Look in chapter 3. And look at verse 17. Hold on, I've got to wash down my pear. In Genesis 3, 17, look at this. This is after the fall, after Adam and Eve have sinned and fallen. And unto Adam he said, because thou, uh, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it, look at it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. And so what do we see here in Genesis 3.17? The ground is cursed. And this was fruit of the ground that Cain had brought. He brings an offering that's tainted with the sin of man. And when we bring to God our own works and say, here's my offering, this is the thing that merits me having eternal life, what you've got to understand is that your life, every action in your life is tainted with sin. Because we're all sinners. In fact, uh, look with me, if you would, in Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6. Isaiah 64 and verse 6. Isaiah says, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness, righteousnesses, are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. That, that passage in Isaiah chapter 64 shows us that our righteousnesses, any righteous act that we may uh, do in our life, is like a what? It's like a filthy rag. You see, when I do good works in my life, I look at myself like this. Righteous, clean, white. When God looks at my life and my good works, he sees this. He sees a mess. He sees a filthy rag. Now this is chocolate syrup. Your filth is nasty. This at least smells good. <laughs> now, here's what I want you to understand. He's not talking about your evil works. The evil things that you do are as a filthy rag. He says your righteousness is as a filthy rag. Even the best things that I do, that I try and do in my life, is tainted with sin. And even this one that I'm holding out, I, we dug these out of our, our rag bin, man. That's not clean. I know it's cleaner than this, but it's not clean. And even if I took this one home and I washed it and I Cloroxed it and I did all these things and got it as spotless as I could, guess what? Still dirty. Still has dirt in it. And we can try and clean up our act. Man, I'm stopping. I got, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to toe the line from here on out. I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live righteously from this moment forward. Guess what? Still dirty. Because God's standard is perfection. 
And, and so it's not on the basis of my righteousness, my good works, because everything I do is tainted with sin. Uh, look in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 9. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 9. It says this, and be found in him, in Christ, not having, say the next three words with me, mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God, how? By faith. So Paul tells us in Philippians 3.9, that any righteousness that I try and develop in my life through the keeping of God's law is not sufficient. It's not truly righteousness. It's as filthy rags. And so what I need is not my own righteousness, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He was always right. He had never sinned. And when I trust him as Savior, I get into Christ, and it's as though God views me through him. I get into heaven on the basis of his righteousness, not on the basis of my own righteousness, because my righteousness isn't very righteous. Now, Cain brings the, the fruit of the ground, which was cursed. He brings an offering that doesn't have any blood. But he also, if we read carefully in Genesis chapter 4, one of the things that we see, it says that he brought the fruit of the ground. He didn't bring the first fruits of the ground. And we don't have time to get into it all this morning, but if you look in some of the Old Testament passages about bringing fruit, it always tells us that we are to bring the first fruits. What is the first fruits? Well, that would be the very first part of the harvest. Whatever the first things I gleaned from the harvest were, I brought those first things to God as an offering. Proverbs chapter three says we honor God through the giving of our first fruits. Why? Why does it matter that it's the first fruits? Because that shows faith. Because I don't know what's gonna happen with the rest of my harvest. If I bring God the first part, hey God, here, here's the first fruits of my harvest, I don't know if the locusts are going to descend upon my crop. I don't know if we're going to have a flood that wipes out everything that I'm trying to grow. I don't know if we're going to experience a drought and all my plants are going to die. It requires faith on my part to bring God the first because I don't know if there's going to be anything left for me. And so we can see that Cain, he didn't do that. He brought leftovers. It didn't require faith. He said, oh, okay, I got mine. Here, God, take this. I'm sure it was great, just wasn't obedient. Now, let's turn our attention to Abel. What did Abel bring? It says that he brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. He brought innocent lambs to be offered to God. Now, whereas Cain represented people at work, the works of our righteousness, Abel represents God at work, trusting in his work and, and what he had done. And notice again, he brings the firstlings, the very first ones that were born. He doesn't know if there are going to be other ones born, if he'll have anything left. He gave the first to God. Shows faith, doesn't it? But why was it accepted? Well, it was accepted because it was offered in faith. And we also know that faith comes from where? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? The word of God. So our faith comes from us listening or hearing what God says in his word. I hear it, I act upon it. The same is true in the life of Abel. The bringing of the firstlings of the flock, bringing a lamb as an offering for sin, had been established by God with his parents. God had spoken. God had instituted this. Let me show you. Look in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21. Again, this is after the fall. You may recall that Adam and Eve, after they fall, they hide, don't they? 
They're trying to hide from God. But not only did they do that, it says that they made themselves aprons or garments made out of fig leaves, right? They're trying to cover their, the shame of their nakedness by their own efforts. And then God shows up. He deals with them. And then in verse 21, look what it says. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Now let me ask you. He didn't go up to TJ Maxx. He didn't stop by Kohl's. He didn't go to Walmart. Where did he get the skins? Something had to die, didn't it? Something innocent died. And it was a lamb. I'm confident of that. That God killed an innocent lamb. He shed its blood in order to make clothing for humanity. To cover their sin. He shed innocent blood and clothed them in the remnants of that. Now, you say, Brad, you're kind of stretching. No, I'm not. Let's look at it. Look at Isaiah 61. And I'm just scratching the surface here. There's, I mean, I, I'm trying to be sensitive to you and, and to, mostly to the people working with the children in the back. But we could be here a while. Isaiah chapter 61, look at verse 10. He says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. Look at it. For he hath clothed me. With what? With the garments of salvation. He hath covered me, look at it, with the robe of what? Righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. I want you to see that, that God likens salvation to being clothed. Just like he took those skins and clothed Adam and Eve after they had sinned. He likens it unto a robe of righteousness. Because they couldn't get there on the basis of their own righteousness. They needed the righteousness of Jesus Christ in order to get to heaven. Look with me in Romans chapter 3 and verse 22. Romans chapter 3 and verse 22. It says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith... That's an important phrase, of Jesus Christ unto all, look at it, unto all, and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. He tells us in Romans chapter 3 that this righteousness of Jesus Christ, which we obtain through faith, is not only unto all, but upon all like a garment, like a robe. I can't get there on the basis of my own righteousness. I need the righteousness of God. And that righteousness comes to me like a garment as I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Now we saw one of the problems with Cain's offering is no blood. But Abel, he brought blood as a sacrifice. That's not real blood. Don't freak out, all right? Look. A little tart. <laughs> Symbolizes blood. He had blood that he brought. He had a lamb that shed its innocent blood as an offering. And this is important because Hebrews chapter 9 and 22, look on the screen. It says, and almost all things are by the law purged with what? Blood. And without the shedding of blood is no remission. If there's no blood... There's no remission. Now, there's a modern trend in religion to remove blood. Let's not sing any songs about blood because we don't want to offend anybody. Seems kind of pagan, a little creepy. Let's even remove some of the scriptures, some of the verses in the Bible. In fact, if, if you look in Colossians 1.14, you don't have to turn there right now. We'll read it in a little bit. If you have a newer version of the Bible, it, does, it removes the phrase blood. I want you to understand this. Because without blood is no remission of sin. 
And so we need the blood of Jesus Christ. Cain was trying to establish his own righteousness. Abel got what theologians call the imputed righteousness of God. He wasn't righteous, but he's trusting in the work of God to make him righteous through the shedding of the blood of a lamb. Look in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18. The Bible's great. If you're not reading the Bible, you're missing out. Stop watching the stupid Netflix shows and read your Bible. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 18 says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. He's talking about religion there. That doesn't redeem you, he says. Gold and silver, the tradition you got from your, from your parents. Most people are simply the religion they are because mom and dad were that religion. But he says, you're not redeemed by that. In verse 19 it says, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. It's through the blood of Jesus Christ being shed for our sin that we can be redeemed. Not religion, not the works of my own hands, but by the blood. Now look at this. I mean, if you didn't know anything about what I just said, and you think, okay, what are you taking? What you picking? And assume this is real blood. You're like, this is better. This looks better. It's not as messy. I mean, if I had the lamb, I got to draw a line somewhere in my illustrations. If I had, if I had a lamb <laughs> up here and I, and I went through that process that they went through, it would be a mess. I'm sure many of you would leave. Many of you would get sick. <laughs> it was not attractive. This looked a lot better, doesn't it? It's clean, it's tidy, it's not messy, it tastes good. The only problem is, is which one accomplishes what we're trying to accomplish. This one does. It's the blood. The blood of Jesus Christ. Look in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 14. I mentioned this verse a moment ago. Let me, look at this. I want you to see the consistency in God's word. Right back at the very beginning, Genesis 4, he begins to paint a picture that's consistent throughout Scripture. We saw that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground. Abel brought of the firstlings of his flock, the first. Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption, say the next phrase with me, through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Look at 15. Who, speaking of Christ, is the image of the invisible God, look at it, the firstborn of every creature. You see that? He's the firstborn. We talk about him as the only begotten son, yes, but he's also the firstborn of every creature. And so just like Abel brought the firstlings of the flock as Jesus is offered on that cross as a sacrifice to atone for the sins of man, he is the firstborn of God. You can't beat it. Back to Genesis. Let's see what happens. I'm curious, aren't you? <laughs> Genesis 4 and verse 5. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. God had not respect. And Cain was very wroth. He's mad. And his countenance fell. He's not hiding it very well. He's wearing it on his face. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and, and why is thy countenance falling? Now we understand that whenever God asks questions, he never asks them for his benefit. He asks them for the benefit of the person being asked. Because he wants him to come face to face with what's going on. In verse 7, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall, uh, shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Talking about that relationship between the older brother Cain and the younger brother Abel. Now let me ask you this, why is Cain angry? I would submit to you that he is angry because of his self-righteousness, because of his pridefulness. 
in his heart, in his opinion, he brought a more excellent sacrifice than Abel did. He worked hard to grow that fruit of the ground. And so when God says, I'm not accepting that, that's not good enough. How many of you like to be told that's not good enough? None of us do. We immediately go, what do, what do you mean? What do you mean that's not good enough? You're not good enough. <laughs> right? We get all defensive and self-righteous. <laughs> but he's got this self-righteousness, this pride. And by the way, that's what religion produces. Because we're holding up to God. God, look what I did. Look over here, Lord. Look, look at all the wonderful things that I've done in my life. Look at this. Don't look at them. Look at this. It lifts us up in pride, doesn't it? And, and, and a subtle part of this is, in our mind, it makes God uh, to be at our disposal. In other words, it, it makes him indebted to us. You owe me because of what I did. Now, that's a subtle thing, but that's a dangerous thing. When I think that God owes me because of the way I live, I've crossed over into that place of self-righteousness and pridefulness. God doesn't owe me anything. He doesn't owe you anything. And when we begin to hold up our works, that's why Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says what it says. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, right? He says, not according to our works. Why? Lest any man boast. If it's by my works, then I'm going to start to boast about it, brag about it. Hey, look at me. I'm better than you. It creates this self-righteousness because he wanted to do it his way. I mean, I believe Cain was a huge Frank Sinatra fan. Or Elvis, who did the remake. I think his theme song was, I did it my way. What an arrogant song, man. You better do it Yahweh, right? <laughs> I did it Yahweh. We're going to remake that. Somebody, John, get on that. But that's what religion does. It creates in us this arrogance, this self-righteousness where we think, well, I deserve, God owes me. Look what I've done. And this has been passed down from the time of Cain through religion till right now. In fact, in, in Jude chapter one and verse 11, look on the screen, we'll just put it up there real quick. It says, woe unto them, for they have gone, look at it, in the way of Cain. See that? In the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. And so he tells us that there's a way of Cain. What is that way? It's a way of trying to connect with God through my own self-righteous works, and not through the methodology of God. That's what all religion is about. Making our own works the way that we get back to heaven. But Cain's way was a way without blood. It was a way without faith. It was a self-righteous way. By the way, it was a way that seemed right, but the end thereof were the ways of death, according to the book of Proverbs. Cain's actions didn't draw him closer to God. They actually put more distance between him and God because not only is he not operating according to God's plan, he is being prideful. Do you know the only person that God can't save is a prideful person? I mean, in Scripture, you see murderers connect with God. Be saved. You see thieves be saved. You see drunkards saved. Adulterers saved. Liars saved, but you never see one prideful person get saved. You say, Brad, we all, we're all prideful. Yeah, but you, in order to be saved, you had to come to a point in your life where you went, God, I'm not enough. I can't get to heaven on my own. And you come to the end of your pride, 
and you trust in the finished work of Christ, and that's what saves you. But if you're trusting in yourself, you're trusting in your own self-righteousness, you're not going to get there. Now, God gives Cain a chance, doesn't he? He gives him a choice. Look at verse 8, chapter 4 and verse 8. Hang with me. Let's bring this thing home. He says, And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Isn't it interesting that the first animal that dies in Scripture is a lamb? And the first person who dies in Scripture is a shepherd. John chapter 1 and verse 29, John the Baptist looks at Jesus and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 20, it says, And now the God of peace that brought again from the dead the Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Ladies and gentlemen, way back in Genesis, thousands of years before Christ even showed up, God is already painting pictures for us. That's why we'll see in a moment that he says that the blood of Abel is crying out. He's talking to us from the grave because he's trying to show us this is how you get back to God. I wonder how that conversation went between Cain and Abel out in the field. Might, it, might, might Cain's comments to Abel have been, you think you're so holy and perfect. You, you think you're better than me, don't you? Ever hear that from anybody? As you were talking with them about Christ? And they're religious, but they're not saved? I've heard it many times. But that wasn't true at all, was it, of Abel? In fact, the opposite was true. He didn't think he was better. He didn't think he was more righteous. In fact, he thought that the only way that he could be accepted was by coming to God as an undeserving sinner and trusting in the shed blood of the Lamb. It was only by God's grace that he could be saved. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 10, it says, And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Abel's still speaking today, isn't he? He tells us we need a perfect Savior. Let's look at Hebrews 11 and verse 4 again. Read that with me. It says, by faith Abel offered. He did what? He offered. His faith moved, didn't it? Unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. God clearly is laying out the plan for salvation, the redemption of humanity. He tells us who we are and what we need, who we are. We're sinners. What we need? A savior. A lamb. Right from the very beginning, he's showing us that. And that savior, ladies and gentlemen, is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. He came to die in our place. He came to take the penalty that we deserve and to give us life. It says in Hebrews 11 and verse 4 that Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. Can I just tell you, Jesus Christ is the most excellent sacrifice. His sacrifice ended all other sacrifices. In fact, if you read the entire book of Hebrews, one of the themes in the book of Hebrews is better. The word better. Jesus is better. Jesus is better. Jesus is better. That old way, that old religious way, Jesus is better. He is the most excellent sacrifice. It's through that sacrifice that we obtain righteousness, the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. And just like God, it says, gave testimony to the gifts that Abel brought, God testifies to the finished work of Christ 
This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The truth is this. We can't live a good enough life to get to heaven on our own. You can't. You just can't. I'm sorry, but you can't. Because you're not perfect, and only perfect things are in heaven. But Jesus was perfect. I, I want to look at one last passage this morning, and we'll be finished. Thanks for sticking with me for so long. Look in Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, and let's start reading in verse 3. Now, let's insert ourselves into the passage, okay? For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, and hating one another. That was our condition pre-Christ. You were sometime that. You were sometime before Christ. That describes our existence. Verse 4, but after. After that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward, uh, toward man appeared. What a beautiful verse that is. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared. Wow. Five. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now that passage we just read starts off really bad. Man, you were sometime this, and that's not a great list, is it? I, I don't know about you, I could add some to that list for myself. <laughs> There's some stuff he left out. <laughs> I got a lot of mo. I do. But then it turns in verse 4, doesn't it? God didn't leave us in that condition. Praise the Lord. Because of his kindness, because of his love, he made a way for us to enter heaven. He appeared. And it wasn't by works of righteousness which we have done, verse 5 says, was it? But according to what? His mercy, he saved us. Mercy is withholding the punishment that's due. The punishment that we deserve is hell. Death, separation from God for all of eternity. That's what we deserve. And yet, through his mercy, he withholds the punishment that we're due on the basis of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He saves us according to his mercy. And then later on, we see in verse 7, that being justified, how? By his grace. That's getting what you don't deserve. That's eternal life. Mercy, he withholds the punishment that I do deserve, hell, Grace, he gives me what I don't deserve, eternal life in heaven. Praise the Lord. He does that for us. It's not by our works of righteousness. It's not by religion. It's by a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we can get fooled into thinking that it's on the basis of what I do. It's on the basis of my fruit that I get eternal life, rather than believing that it's by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. It's by religion and not relationship. This is why Jesus is different than anybody that's ever existed. 
because he's the only perfect person that's ever lived. Only one. The only person that was untainted by sin. His blood was perfect. And yet he took a penalty that I deserved. He, he, he died so that I wouldn't have to. I deserve death. He gives me life. And not only to me, not only to you, but to anyone who by faith will put their trust in his most excellent sacrifice. But you've got to move from that place of religion to that place of relationship. To that, from that place where maybe you know a lot of information about Jesus to you know him as Savior. God gave Cain a choice And he chose the wrong way. God gives us a choice. You have to decide what you're going to do. Am I going to go my way? Or am I going to go God's way? My way is not sufficient. My way is not good enough. Even my righteousness is like a filthy rag. But what Jesus does is he takes my rag and gives me his rag. He takes my righteousness upon him on the cross. And he gives me his perfect righteousness so that I can go to heaven. And all I got to do is trust him as my savior. Come to the end of myself Put away my pridefulness and self-righteousness and trust in Jesus as Savior. Let's pray. As you're bowing your heads, you're closing your eyes. I, I can't preach a message like that and not give an invitation to be saved. And when I say invitation, it's not really me inviting you to do anything, but it's you inviting God to come into your heart and save you. But if you're here and you don't know Christ as Savior, if you're here and you're trusting in your own self-righteousness, your good works to get you into heaven, it's time to abandon your way and do it Yahweh. <laughs> Do it God's way. And being saved is not a complicated thing. God made it very simple. It's not easy because it requires me swallowing my pride, coming to the end of self and trusting in Jesus. But it is simple. Here it is. Jesus lived, died, was buried, but he was raised back to life on the third day. If you believe that he is the Son of God and that God raised him from the dead on the third day, you can be saved. You confess that and call upon him. The Scripture says that he will save you. And So if you're here this morning and you want to be saved, I want to invite you to just pray along with me. Pray a prayer with me that expresses that. Trust God this morning. Trust Jesus this morning as Savior. God in heaven, I come into your presence in prayer admitting that I'm a sinner. And I know the penalty of my sin is death, eternal death. But I come also believing that Jesus was the Son of God, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. I believe that he lived and died, was buried, but you raised him back to life on the third day. And it's through his sacrifice on the cross and through his glorious resurrection that I can have eternal life. I confess these things to you this morning. And I call upon the name of Jesus to save me. 
I'm not trusting in my own works, in my own righteousness, in my own way. I'm trusting in Jesus alone. If you prayed that prayer this morning with me and you trusted Christ as Savior, let me just say congratulations. It's awesome. It really is. If you were saved this morning, I want to encourage you to tell somebody that. You can come tell me. You can tell a person that's next to you. You stop out at the Connect desk. We've got a gift bag for you that will help you in your journey. Welcome to the family. Now, my suspicion is that most people here this morning are already saved. You're already a believer. But let me challenge us that are believers this morning as we get ready to leave. You've trusted Christ as Savior, but are you still trying to do things your way instead of his way? You still trying to live life by your own homespun philosophy? Or are you trusting in the word of God and what he says? Do you fall into the camp of Cain where you kind of do what God says? But you're really giving God leftovers, not the first fruits. God saved you. And now he wants you to live your life for him and for his glory. Helping others to come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. To see their eternities altered the way yours was. God is a wonderful God. He's kind. He's loving. He's merciful. He's gracious. And he's made a way for us to have eternal life. Praise be to God. Father, we come to you this morning as your children and ask that we would be about the business of helping others who don't know you to come to know you as Savior. Maybe it's a family member or a co-worker. Maybe it's a person that we work with, a person that we know from the ball fields where our kids play soccer and baseball and basketball. Maybe it's a a person that we see frequently at the grocery store. Whatever the case may be, Father, let us be about your business. Let our light shine to them. Lord, we desire to see them saved the way you desire to see us saved. So we ask that you would help us to be about your business, all of it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.